Welcome to SNC's Power Up webinar asking the question, are your feeders fully optimized for grid reliability? My name is Spencer Zirkelbach and I'll be your host for today's webinar and want to start off by saying thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We have a wide range of attendees from electric power utilities, public power, federal governments, the media, and consultants. We want to take, make this webinar a great use of your time, which we believe starts with getting our audience's input on today's topic. We will be doing that through a few polls during the webinar that we encourage you to participate in. We're going to start right away. I'm going to share a poll right now, asking the question of what you're doing to modernize, what initiatives you're taking to modernize your, organization, your, your feeders at your organization. So we'd like to know which of the following modernization initiatives your organization currently has in place on your grid. I've shared this question in a poll and encourage you all attendees to respond and as you answer that, I have a few administrative items to cover. This webinar is being recorded and a recording will be shared after the event along with a helpful guidebook on modernizing feeders. Attendees will also be sent a brief one question survey. We would greatly appreciate a few seconds of your time to provide feedback on today's content. Attendee microphones are muted and we have turned off the chat feature. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to ask any questions you have throughout this webinar. We will address all the questions at the end. Finally, if you have any technical difficulties, you can also use the Q&A function and a member of the SNC team will help. Now that we have those out of the way, let me introduce our panelists who will be sharing their expertise with us. Dave Myers has more than 30 years of experience in worldwide electric power systems engineering and leadership. Combining his experience in field service, product development, and commercial operations, David serves SNC's customers as vice president of feeder automation, where he enables customers to improve resiliency and reliability through SNC's portfolio of overhead and underground automated products. Jerry Yakel currently serves as the regional vice president for the South Central region at SNC, where he utilizes his 35 years of power industry experience to solve power system challenges for SNC's customers. Jerry brings an outstanding breadth of perspectives, having held leadership roles in product management and power system strategy. Finally, we are very pleased to have Jeremy Preis with us today from Texas Utility Encore. Jeremy has been with Encore for almost 15 years where he has held roles in transmission protection and control, as well as distribution operations. He is currently the distribution SCADA automation manager where he provides engineering and technical support for Encore's fleet of distribution automation equipment. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your time with this group today. Now, I'm going to share the poll results and turn it over to Jerry to discuss them. Jerry? Thanks, Spencer. Uh, let's see what we have coming in. So um, AMS systems, uh, automatic feeder switching, uh, segmentation is very interesting to hear. It'll be talking about that and a lot more. So it's great. These, these are all wonderful initiatives and each on its own, I know from experience is gonna have a great payback. Uh, certainly this is also saying that this audience is in tune with the larger conversations that's around grid modernization. However, it's uh, also interesting to point out that several of the items that are listed here involve systems or technologies that are not physically on the feeder. So for example, some of the software systems like DMS or AMI networks, very beneficial, no doubt, but the reality is they do very little to improve base reliability. The fact is I could go on and even say a little bit more boldly that many of the items in modern grid conversations require a reliable grid to perform. So Dave, you can advance the slide for me, please. So the main takeaway is it's important to assess the impacts of your in-scope items on your grid as it performs today. So many of the initiatives as we just talked about, or, or better yet, many of the initiatives assume, or better yet, disregard the current state of reliability. Uh, one example I would share is, you know, like DERs, uh, solars, or those types of things, inverter-based technology. Some inverters uh, will actually trip offline if they see momentaries. So that's an example where applications require a reliable grid to be effective. And it's never been more important to begin your modernization journey with a focus on the foundational efforts. And that is to reduce the momentary outages and to limit the effect of faults 
no matter how big they are or small, how long they are, to the smallest area through segmentation. As the slide would indicate, these are the two investments that we believe are base and foundational to building a reliable grid. So Dave, you could advance the slide, please. Today's webinar, we're gonna focus on three essentials to modern feeders or modernizing feeders. One is the practical steps to optimization. It's not an exhaustive list of the, the main highlights. Second is the, pointing out the fact that modernization is getting easier through the application of technologies. And then finally, and certainly not least, we'll have some real world examples being shared on Encore's uh, feeder modernization journeys. So David, you can advance the slide. Let's get started by talking about the practical steps of optimization. So Dave, first, start with the basics. We need to define what a modern grid is. And as we've been discussing during the introductions, that definition can get confused by sometimes defining it through technology deployments and other things. But at, at its basics, a modern grid is a reliable, self-healing, and I'd like to add customer-centered or serving the customer. And if not, I guess you'd kind of ask yourself, what's the point? Okay, good day, if you can advance me, please. So let's discuss some of these items in, in some detail, beginning with reliability. So rely, recall that on my introductory discussions, we build a reliable grid by minimizing momentary interruptions. And this is all against the backdrop of increasing customer expectations and squeezed operational budgets. So momentaries needlessly impact those budgets by every year requiring truck rolls and crews to get sent out, dealing with things that can be dealt with in, in more effective, effective and efficient ways. All the while the crew is out there doing those types of things, it's dropping your customer satisfaction either through momentaries or even unexpected longer duration outages. And then also, as I mentioned in the introductory, uh, momentaries challenge some technologies, such as the DER example I gave you by dropping them offline. So one simple step is that we should no longer have, say, for example, substation devices responding to transient or temporary faults across the entire feeder, blinking that entire feeder. The solution actually is to move the transient protection closer to the fault sources. In some cases that can either be on a lateral or in some cases to the very edges of the grid. Doing this keep temporary, keeps temporary faults confined to the smallest possible area. In the center section of the slide, you'll see that if an outage is permanent in nature and some do evolve to become permanent, then it becomes important for a modern grid to limit that outage to the smallest possible area. The fewest customers out, the higher the satisfaction and the faster the restoration time. I like to flip it around and talk about it in, in terms of small, uh, small outages just heal faster. And by, by virtue of that being healed faster, fewer customers are affected in the process. So we accomplish this by adding protection and segmentation points to break the feeder into smaller customer increments. As this is a way to limit the number of customers that are out. Now, adding these protection points has been a challenge, but modern technology is available that makes it much easier, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes. But lastly, in the terms of uh, reliability items, there is the need to, in certain sections, harden the grid. And in some locations, that means transitioning from overhead lines to putting them underground or undergrounding. However, once again, unfortunately, this is traditionally uh, presented a protection engineer with a challenge of how do I minimize momentaries and still protect and, 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 and segment the portion of the feeder? Oftentimes, that means that the protection engineer would be, the protection sequence would be compromised or even shortened because we didn't want to pass uh, large amounts of fault current through expensive underground cable. However, again, modern technology, low energy fault finding technology is allowing protection engineers the ability to test the entire circuit for transients and if the fault is permanent, segment and lock out only to the affected area, even if that is on the underground segment. So I guess I'd go on to say is that yes, you can harden without compromise. Dave, if you could advance me, please. The next step uh, and the practical steps on uh, modernizing feeders is to make modern feeders self-healing or they should be self-healing. So what that means is once the initial fault is located and segmented to the smallest portion of the system, 
And this is at the end of protection response, or I even like to add is that protection speed. We can begin to recover or heal any remaining portions of the feeder that aren't directly impacted by the fault zone. A common way to do this, and it's nothing that is terribly new, it's been done for a number of years, but looping feeders or connecting adjacent feeders with a tie device. It's a very proactive step in providing an alternative source that allows the utility another, another source to reconnect and recover uh, more customers on an adjacent feeder. And as I said, this reconfigura reconfiguration scheme is fairly common. The point is that actually everything I've been talking about so far, and even this tie point connection can happen and has been happening and existing without communications as the basis for making it operate. It can operate on something as simple as a heuristic item, like a, like a presence of voltage as a logic driver. So another point to be made here is that, again, here's a case where low energy technology can make this happen with out needless, needless uh, energy damage or even over tripping. Then we also talk about self-healing. And as the system builds out, you can feather in at more advanced restoration logic schemes. And they can be added that enhance and, re and, and, and allow more customers to be brought back online faster. Uh, the key is uh, the, the key, the speed of protection responds in segments to the smallest fault area initially. So it's very, very fast. And then restoration protect, and then restoration systems can begin to re bring more customers online. Again, smaller faults can be restored faster uh, by keeping them limited at the, at the very beginning. Sometimes that can be done uh, again without communications, as we talked about in the loose, loose loop example, excuse me. The last step, and it's often really in reality in parallel to that segmentation uh, strategy that I was mentioning just a few minutes ago, is to add communications. And this has been an invaluable productivity tool by helping uh, utilities gain situational awareness. Communications often is used to assist crews through repair and restoration. Communications process, as we all know, can provide status, fault locations. It can work in conjunction with crews to switch to isolate to bring work zones or open up work zones. And even at the end of a, of a repair process can be used as a productivity tool to remotely switch in or bring back on sections of the system without having to send crews long distances to switch in and bring back on uh, parts of the feeder. Dave, if you can advance me, advance me please. Uh, one final point that I mentioned to you, and this is kind of new and emerging, and that's uh, by uh, most optimized feeders or modern feeders, you need to make them customer centric. Now, many of the technologies that we talked about or in the poll question have an impact, uh, a customer impact in their business case. They, they would have to. Customers are getting, giving more choices. We're providing more information to end customers. And overall, we're enhancing and making their experience better. So what I would say is reliability is no exception to this rule. However, reliability has been an activity that this industry has been engaged in for well, at least as long as I know, and it's been well over 30 years. So you kind of ask yourself, why isn't our needle moving faster? Or maybe even to go so far, why isn't our reliability needle pegged to the right? As an industry, we still, I think, average somewhere around 120 minutes in duration with uh, major event days and things removed. And we probably, as a system, an overall industry average one to two, uh, five minute or longer duration momentaries uh, on overall in our systems. Now, we know our customers expect more these days. This recent pandemic has moved offices into homes and customers are beginning to question why the experience at home is so much different, better or worse than they had in the office. So the fact of the matter is we, in general, improve things by what we measure. And not all customers on the system experience the same reliability. It's a natural fact. Measuring reliability then from a customer standpoint is the way a modern grid activity can be made sustainable from a customer experience standpoint. Again, otherwise, what's the point? Reliability metrics then should begin with a C as is shown on the slide or, or we'll begin with a customer to have the most impact. A couple of indexes that are emerging these days are semi, which is customers experiencing momentary interruptions. And there's typically a, a number after that, semi five, semi 10, semi 15. It's becoming a common reliability metrics in the utility industry because it highlights the worst experiences customers are seeing in the system 
so that a utility can systemically address them and fix them. Another one on the duration side is the CLED, customers experiencing long duration interruptions. And again, it's the same thing. It helps utilities focus in on customer areas that are experiencing long duration outages for systemic improvements. David, you can advance me to my last one. I like this chart because the main takeaway to, point to, to it is uh, that reliability metrics deal with improvements on a system-wide basis. What, you know, we, we make these improvements on our 10 worst feeders or whatever it is, and we, and we measure by what the overall system impact is. And that's fine, it just may or may not, as we talked about, uh, reflect the, reli the actual reliability that some individuals are seeing on the system. Now there's a great webinar that goes into deep detail on this. So I'll not repeat it here for the interest of time. So if, as you can see in the top right, for more information, go to the SNC website and look for a, look for a, a session, a section uh, called Moving Beyond Average Reliability Metrics. There you'll find a you know, very interesting white paper and you can watch the power up webinar on that. So Dave, you can advance us. Now that we've defined uh, what constitutes a modern feeder, and we've talked about practical steps that can be taken to achieve it, I'd like to learn more about what existing system roadblocks you might be facing. So at this point, I'll pass the mic over to Dave Meyer, who will start by getting some additional feedback from you. Dave? Thanks, Jerry. So the, the poll question is, what is preventing your, your utility from justifying the funding needed to limit outages to smaller number of customers per event? We're very interested to see which of these common challenges are faced by the webinar participants. While waiting for the poll results to come in, I'd like to remind everyone that the Q&A functionality is active. Please type your questions in the Q&A section. We'd very much like to hear what's on your minds regarding feeder monetization and the information we're presenting. So the, the responses here are uh, really simple ones related to um, looping feeders, uh, limitations around communications, protective device coordination challenges, and the like. Let's see what's come through. Um, very similar to what I've heard from other folks, we've got uh, no or limited communications. The big one being how do we deal with protective device coordination challenges when you add additional uh, stops, uh, complications, and also um, uh, a little bit around reliability reliability not being a uh, priority. Interestingly, everyone here is able to loop things. So that's actually a good foundation for, for what we're going to do. Well, in the past, any one of these challenges could have made the modernization process difficult. But let's shed some lights on the capabilities of newer technologies and how these capabilities are actually making modernization easier. Segmenting circuits into several discrete portions is important for reliability, fault location, and service restoration, but it can be challenging to maintain protective device coordination when adding protective devices to feeders. Greater segmentation can easily be achieved when utilizing devices with high accuracy sensing and low energy fault finding capability. Let's look at a few of these examples, starting with high accuracy sensing. We've got a very basic circuit here, starting with uh, some fixed endpoints that are pretty hard to move. A substation circuit breaker or a closer, and it's an associated time current characteristic curve or TCC curve. And then there'll usually be lateral fuses along the feeder out to the end here, and we're showing the largest fuse of all those lateral fuses here. The common approach to greater segmentation is to add a midline recloser, splitting the customers in half. Customers, the recloser's nominal uh, curve uh, must fit between the fuse and the circuit breaker, shown here. But to get proper coordination, we also need to add recloser clearing time, current tolerances, percent time tolerances, and fixed time tolerances. When, we, when we're done, there's no room to add another recloser. So it really looks like there's not much more we can do than one segmentation point. Devices with accurate current sensing and integrated system design with controls, cables, sensors all together have a 2% tolerance resulting in a much thinner TCC curve. 
you watch the middle curve as it moves, it's showing the difference between a conventional reclosing TCC curve that we built up on the previous slide and the equivalent curve for a device with high accuracy sensing and which ends up being significantly narrower. So in this case, with a narrow, narrower curves, you could actually coordinate three devices with high accuracy sensing in series, shown here as PC1, PC2, and PC3. All three fit in the exact same space where there was only one recloser before. And while it's unlikely to actually configure a circuit like this, the plot shows that high accuracy sensing enables tight coordination of many devices in series, still maintaining all margins at all current levels. It's here at the lower current levels, it's a little tighter at the medium levels, but still coordinates and even at the high current levels. But there's another approach to greater segmentation that's even easier utilizing devices with the capability to perform low energy fault finding, such as pulse closing technology. Here are the same three segmentation points again, PC1, PC2, PC3, but this time they have the exact same TCC settings. No coordination study is needed to figure this one out, but let's see how having the same TCC curve can still provide additional segmentation. But a fault occurs as shown, all four devices see the fault current and the three segmenting devices, PC1, PC2, PC3, all trip open since they have the exact same TCC curve and are coordinated with the circuit breaker. Only the device labeled PC1 has an energized source since PC1 is open. So PC1 will perform a test sequence with low energy test. And it will successfully close since PC2 and PC3 are still open and isolating the fault. Next, PC2 has an energized source, so it'll perform a test sequence with low energy test and successfully close since PC3 is still open and isolating the fault. Finally, since PC3 has an energized source, so it'll perform a test sequence low energy test, but this one will lock out isolating the fault. You may be wondering if PC1 and PC2 with the same TCC curve as PC3 will see the fault current and also trip while PC3 is performing its test sequence. Since the pulse of current during low energy test is only five to eight milliseconds long and with a reduced amount of current, neither one of them will trip. So the next step in modernization is to add self-healing to feeders when the protection sequence ends. This can be done simply without the need for communications by loop restoration. Here's an example of a typical three device loop using two midline reclosers and a tie point recloser between the two feeders. The midline reclosers are normally closed and the tie point is normally open. So we saw earlier, regardless of how much room there is for TCC curves, you can always insert a device with accurate sensing and low energy test capability for additional segmentation. Here we've added two devices, PC2, PC4, one on each feeder between the midline recloser and the normally open tie point recloser. Of course, as we've seen before, we can add more than one device per feeder, but here we'll stick with just one uh, to keep the examples simple. So let's look at how loop restoration works for the fault shown. In this case, R1 detects the fault and opens and goes through a test sequence and then locks out. PC2 senses a loss of voltage and later opens according to a pre-configured loss of voltage timer. R3 also senses the same loss of voltage on one side and waits a longer time than PC2 and then closes to try to restore service. Since the fault is not between R3 and PC2, R3 holds closed and service is restored. Now PC2 senses the return of voltage, so it waits a pre-configured time, then pulses to test the line. In this case, the fault is still there, so PC2 locks out. Power is restored to all but the faulted segment. But let's think about what would have happened if the fault was next to R3, here where the arrow is pointing. When R3 closed to test the fault uh, on the line, it would have put fault current on the adjacent unfaulted feeder down here 
meaning customers served from the lower feeder would have been subjected to a voltage sag, even though the fault was on the upper feeder. This is one of the biggest complaints about using reclosers in loop systems. And it's where low energy tests can be used instead to solve the problem in a bitter, better, different way. So let's look at a different example here. This is a similar circuit to before, to before, but for even more benefits, it has a device capable of low energy tests at the tie point here, PC3. Fault occurs this time in the line section between PC2 and PC3. PC2 detects the fault, trips open before R1 does, and tests the line. In this case, the fault is permanent, so PC2 will lock out. PC3 detects the loss of voltage, and after a preset time, will low energy test the line. The test detects the fault is still present, and PC3 locks out. Because the low energy test is only a few milliseconds long with a reduced amount of current, R4 and PC, R5 and PC4 do not see the fault. And in fact, the whole lower feeder is spared from experiencing a voltage sag. If the tie point was a recloser, there would be a large amount of fault current when it tests the upper line and all the devices on the lower feeder would start timing and there would have been a voltage sag for all of these customers. But with a device with low energy tests, this problem is solved and there are no voltage sags uh, for any of the customers. So in summary, we've covered simple ways to modernize a feeder. High accuracy sensing enables narrow TCC curves for better coordination and segmentation, which improves reliability metrics. Low energy fault finding ensures lockout coordination, even if TCC curves overlap. More segmentation can be achieved on any circuit, Coordinate what you can, use low energy tests to extend the segmentation to any degree you wish. Loop restoration provides self-healing without communications and can do so without unnecessary voltage sags when devices with low energy test capability are used. And while the examples we discussed are on all, all on overhead systems, they are equally applicable on underground and hybrid systems that include sections of both overhead and underground. Now, I'm very pleased to pass it over to Jeremy to give us a glimpse into Encore's real life experiences with feeder modernization. Jeremy. All right, thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I just wanna start off by giving everybody a little bit of background on uh, Encore and what our system looks like. So uh, you can see in the blue there, we cover about 55,000 square miles. Uh, northern part of Texas. We're char characterized by high population growth right now, extremely fast population growth. Um, coming from West Texas to East Texas, we also span various biomes, if you will, having desert areas in West and getting into swamplands in the East, as well as the urban jungle in Dallas and Fort Worth and reaching down towards Austin. Also, we have high summer temperatures, uh, so we're dealing with summer loading issues pretty consistently, and um, <clears throat> it appears that we're also dealing with winter concerns now as well. Um, now I'm going to talk about the, from a technology perspective and uh, in that level, but I, I, I think it should be taken for granted that any good feeder modernization program will require some good capital investments which we're blessed with. And then also vegetation management is pretty high up on that priority list of modernizing your feeders. Uh, so I just wanted to be sure to mention that. If you could go to the next slide, please, sir. So this is a look at about the last 10 years uh, worth of safety and safety numbers for Encore. Um, Dave, you can go ahead and click it twice and get those quote bubbles up, that'll work. If you'll notice in 2013, that's when we completed our AMS rollout. And while that didn't necessarily directly impact SADI, it did give us a new source of data to calculate our um, SADI more accurately. So we do start to see a decline there um, right after we completed the rollout. DA started in 2016, and I'll talk about those technologies, but essentially it's segmentation and communication supporting those devices. Uh, 2017 and 18, we're really seeing some significant improvements in SADI as well as our uh, 
our safety numbers are starting to decline as well. Okay, you can go to the next one. So let's talk about how we got from there to here um, from a technology perspective. You can go to the next one. So we have a quote unquote distribution automation program, which is a large capital program encompassing five technologies. Uh, those are communicating FCIs, automating our capacitor system, trip savers for reclosing fuses, of course, reclosers, and then uh, our automatic feeder switching uh, is with the uh, interrupters. We have a couple other large capital programs that we're uh, doing on our system as well. Uh, that's upgrading our downtown networks. That's a program that's just starting. And uh, we're coming onto the tail end of upgrading DFW Airport and uh, other airports around the region. That chart, you can just take a look at the amount of devices that we're putting in year over year. So it is a fairly aggressive plan uh, that we've embarked upon. All right, you can go to the next slide. So let's, let me talk about real quickly, just some of our implementation strategy for four of our technologies. I'm not gonna to touch on capacitors. That's, a, that's fodder for a, another topic in another time, but I digress. Communicating FCIs, uh, we're focusing with those mainly on our underground system right now. We're gonna be putting at least two to three per feeder uh, and more depending on the penetration of switch gear on those feeder. And we're gonna supplement uh, the rest of the locations with non-communicating FCIs. For our overhead system, we're really just uh, supplementing an impedance-based flock, and flock is fault location. So we'll, we'll automatically predict uh, some of the fault locations, and, and then we'll put these overhead devices at the feeder exits and splits to further refine our patrolling location of that fault once we finally go out into the field. Reclosers, the program's aimed at upgrading some of our older uh, hydraulic reclosers. But in general, reclosers are used for lightly loaded or single customer feeders, such as oil filled um, device or oil filled locations. It's also currently we're using reclosers for our distributed generation point of common coupling. But I think we're probably pretty close to pivoting on that and switching over to the interrupter for that one. Um, next slide, please. Okay, for um, segmentation, we do have the trip saver for our lateral uh, protection. Uh, and we're hitting the worst performing feeders there first and working our way throughout the system, uh, going down the, you know, sort of a ranked profile of all of our feeders and laterals. We'll also implement some of these trip savers on very lightly loaded locations that we might put a recloser up. We'll use the 200 amp trip saver uh, in those locations. And those are non-communicating, by the way. And the interrupter and Skatamate is what we're using for the automatic feeder switching. We are using a switch and a half methodology with loop restoration. Uh, and that's where we're cutting the feeder in half, half either by customer count, load count, or geographical distance count. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find a, a mix of those parameters to place the device at the midpoint. We do, in the cases where we have uh, multiple devices on, uh, in series on the feeder, we will use the low energy fault finding as opposed to uh, individually coordinating those devices like Dave mentioned earlier. And we are starting to experiment and play around with communication enhanced coordination. And that's where we allow the series devices to talk to each other. And depending on the fault location, they will speed up or slow down uh, their uh, uh, tripping activity. Also with this program or with the interrupter plan, we are upgrading all of our substations. That's the relaying inside the substation in order to uh, give us load information and fault information. We're upgrading the telecom backhaul at these locations. Uh, getting off of the phone circuits and putting some more robust um, backbone to our telecom system. And the SIMS there, that's just a, a distribution RTU that we're using, uh, that we have firewalled off from the transmission RTU in the substation. 
And that's basically driven by uh, NERC SIP concerns. Also on any of these feeders, if we need to, uh, when we add these devices, we're, we're essentially increasing the capacity. So we're gonna do some reconductoring and other hardening measures in order to make sure that we're not limiting these devices at operating at full uh, throttle. We have the speed net radio mesh is the, uh, you know, it's over 90% of what we're using where we can and where it's cost effective. We do install fiber for the communications for these devices. And uh, we started off the program with SCADA mates. Uh, and then when Intellerupters became available, we switched to that. So in lo existing locations where we have a SCADA mate in a normally closed position, we will move that one to the normally open position and replace that normally closed with an Intellerupter since the Intellerupter is capable of interrupting fault. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> Like I said earlier, we have a pretty aggressive uh, plan that we're embarking on. And so we really had to put a lot of work into uh, the management of the teamwork. Uh, and in order to do that, we have a, a group called the Distribution Program Management Organization. And we have a senior program manager that's responsible uh, specifically for the DA program. What that person's going to do is help us manage all of the workflows and touch points and due dates. Uh, if you look at that chart, that's a very simplified flow chart of all of the different groups that we've got involved in this. Uh, and our DPMO program manager is really gonna help grease the skids on each of those handoffs. Um, a, a new partnership well, not really a new partnership, but a partnership that's been blossoming is the transmission and distribution partnership. You know, typically those are fairly bifurcated, uh, but with the DA, we've had to work really close across the fence uh, with the substation upgrades and telecom refresh. And so that's required uh, a lot of management and change management there as well. Another one that's, uh, um, pretty good to keep your eyes on are the offsites. So the DA program is really a retrofit program, if you will, in which we're going to existing feeders and upgrading and modernizing those feeders. But like I said, our system is growing so fast, uh, we're building new feeder, new substations and new feeders. And when we, when at, for new construction, we also have a standard of implementing these devices and uh, that's in our DA program. So. Not only do we have the DA program, we're having an additional, say, 50 to 100 switches each year just based off of new growth. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Okay, another thing that's been very beneficial um, in Dallas, there is an SNC warehouse uh, where when we place an order, this warehouse is uh, there for staging the materials uh, and uh, you know, we kind of utilize a just-in-time methodology, if you will. So we'll get it in our hands a week or two before we need to install it. And that really helps with inventory flow and whatnot. In addition to that, we will send the programming requirements for the interrupters or trip savers. And uh, they're going to be programmed by S&C. And then sort of an additional layer of sanity checks gets performed as well. Uh, and what it's resulted in is one, a plug and play device, and two, we've had next to no bad order parts that we've had to return. And in those times where we do have a damaged part, it typically ends up being us <laughs> that uh, is responsible for that in shipment and whatnot. Okay, you can go to the next slide. All right, I just wanna talk about now a few lessons learned throughout uh, the few years that we've been in, involved in this program. So, so that second major point there is watch out for knowledge silos and double work. So we've got groups of folks that, you know, you know there's fellows within our organization, they just get it. And they're, they're really quick at grabbing this knowledge and owning it. And so they end up becoming SMEs uh, where everybody sort of levitates towards asking them for divide, uh, advice and help with designs and settings and whatnot. Well, at that, made us fairly vulnerable to vacations, retirements, and attrition through job movement and whatnot. So we, we found that we really needed to clearly identify the roles and responsibilities, and it's a fairly intricate machine work 
with different roles and responsibilities. So we had to spend a lot of time, like I said, clearly identifying those. What that does is each functional group is now able to have a primary and a backup uh, if it is a one-man job. Uh, they're, they're able to have that in place. Also commissioning procedures. So in addition to, you know, getting the benefits from feeder modernization, we also are getting the benefits from standardizing across the system. So standardizing really helps with that first bullet is the ongoing and frequent training. We, we don't necessarily have to do as much since we have a single standard across the system. Um, but in addition to that, when we, we've written commissioning procedures that are very detailed and they're functionally specific. So the, the telecom group gets a procedure on how to install the substation device uh, communication. And they have another procedure for the field devices. Our technicians have an installation procedure as well as the installation and construction crews. So those have really helped in keeping a, or allowing us to gather the knowledge that we need to operate and install these devices. Another one, when we started the program, we had a philosophy where we were chasing Sadie, uh, meaning that we, we were hitting the worst performing feeders so that we could get bang for, for the buck up front. What we found is that that led to a fairly inefficient build out of the comm infrastructure that we have behind um, the devices and supporting the devices. So we switched to a geographical deployment. What that allowed us to do is have sort of a master plan for each geographical area when we're installing the communication nodes in that RF mesh. Uh, what ended up on the SADI side of things is we overbuilt our infrastructure uh, because we were going feeder by feeder. So I feel like it's better to have a geographical deployment. Okay, that last one, um, we did have to put some thought into design into how we were going to handle uh, manual load shed events and situations like that. So you don't want these devices restoring automatically when you're in a short supply or load shed event. So we, we did, uh, we designed a system to where we can sort of surgically define the area we want to say a storm's rolling in. Uh, we can choose that area and take the whole area out of ready, um, you know, via the use of an easy button, if you will. So a little bit of thought of how you're going to do that was something that probably should be put up at the front end. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, I kind of want to pivot here real quick. Um, this last example is just so I just want to give an example. So feeder modernization will obviously directly impact SADI and your other reliability metrics when the device, you're taking the, the, the first, the, the priority switch and you're taking the first operation of a device out of the hands of a human and moving it over into an automatic um, mode. And so, you know, a human's gonna take three, four or five minutes, however long that may be to wrap their head around the situation and take action. These devices will give you results in, 10 seconds, you know, so there's an obvious direct safety benefit, but there's some indirect benefits as well. You know, in our situation, typically we only have that switch and a half rollout. So we have further segmentation that we can do uh, in the meantime to further uh, isolate that fault location. And then also when we go into uh, the restoration efforts as well, since we have all the SCADA information that we're now getting in from these devices that we're sprinkling throughout our feeders, we can inform our operators and the field guys um, more readily with good situational awareness. Uh, another one there, predictive data analytics. So in addition, we're, you, you know, we're getting the extra SCADA information and we've got several systems that we've put in as and for example, over the last several years, we have proactively replaced distribution transformers before they have failed uh, with the data that we're grabbing from everything that's out there. Um, so transformer damage prediction, uh, we're also working on a system that's going to predict weather damage before a storm rolls in that might allow us to stage materials before the storm actually arrives. Uh, so those are sort of the ancillary benefits 
Um, let me give you an example. You can go to the next slide, Dave. This is a project that a group of engineers and operators, as well as some data scientists that work with us, uh, worked on. This is a feeder lockout portal. Uh, and this is a splash screen, splash screen that pops up at right after a feeder locks out. This is something the operator can look at. I want to direct your attention to the, the middle section there. It's got every switch point on the feeder and it gives you relevant information about that section of the feeder that's bound by switching points as far as uh, load limits and uh, what the tie feeder limits will be. And they're able to compare that up to the information up in the top right, which is the actual load loss. And then they can make relevant on the fly decisions um, based on this information. Uh, like I said, this is just an example. We've got many others like this. Okay, I'm ready for the next slide. So I could talk forever, but uh, for the sake of y'all's sustained enthusiasm, I'll go ahead and start to wrap it up. Just some future thoughts. You know, something that, that would be interesting to explore would be dynamic and adaptive coordination of devices. So right now, when we abnormally switch feeders for whatever the reason may be, uh, specifically on feeders that have multiple tie points, these devices aren't necessarily informed of how that abnormal configuration ends up looking like, and that could throw out the coordination of these devices because what was once upstream is now downstream. Uh, so, so you can see how the coordination is going to, to get lost. So, so it'd be nice for these guys, since they are able to communicate with each other uh, and they have high processing power, is for them to make some decisions and notice abnormal changes and uh, adjust their coordination on the edge and on the fly. Another one is the DG penetration in Texas. Uh, I really thought Texas was going to be a late adopter, but they're not. It's, it's coming on so much faster than I was expecting. Uh, so, so these devices are prime opportunity to you know, help us with source control. That's from a safety perspective. Uh, also, feeder coordination is thrown off whenever you have uh, sources sprinkled throughout the feeder. And not to mention, depending on what your philosophy is, you might have anti-islanding philosophy so that before an event happened, your feeder breaker was supplying so much load, but after you isolated the fault and you have all of your DG removed from the uh, circuit, well, now you're gonna be picking up a lot more load. So it's being able to keep track of that would be handy. And the last thing, this is just sort of a visionary look at uh, our evolution within our how we're operating our grid. You know, we used to have a, a mode of operation that was dispatching. We're right now, we're really in an operation mode where we're able to uh, remotely control and perform uh, switching and whatnot from a central location. Well, the future will be is that we're managing the grid much like transmission does with a transmission grid. Uh, we'll let the automatic devices perform their FLISR operations and then we'll be responsible for keeping an eye for contingency planning, load management, and that type of thing. So that's about it. Uh, appreciate you guys' time. So let's just go ahead and round it out and like to hear what you guys think. Spencer, I'm going to hand it back to you, man. Thanks, Jeremy. And thanks again, Jerry, David, and Jeremy for sharing these fantastic insights on modernizing feeders. Uh, we have a lot of questions in already, but be, I want to remind everybody our audience, uh, in our audience to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to post any questions you have. Uh, I'm going to try to get to as many as we can with respect to everybody's time here. So to start off, we have a lot of different questions related to how fast uh, this type of modernization can be done uh, at a utility. And I know that some of the topics that you all touched on. Um, so I think I want to start off one with for Jeremy is for Encore, how long uh, did the setup and deployment of your feeder, nice, feeder modernization plan take? I uh, realize that it's, it's been a process, but I think if we could start there, but how long have you guys been planning and how long it's been taking you and, and is there an end point in sight? Sure. So um, I'll say in 2013, 2014, somewhere in there, uh, we really started putting together some robust business cases and planning for a DA program, the one where you saw the chart with our numbers. Uh, that's when we started 
fact finding and zeroing in on the workflow processes. Uh, the program technically started in 2016, but it really started in earnest in 2017, where we had uh, a decent amount of devices that we were installing. The program's planned to end in 2026. So it was planned to be a 10 year program uh, with about three or four years of preparing and getting ready to kick the program off. Excellent. And maybe Dave or Jerry, could you talk a little bit about from your perspectives, what you've seen, you know, how fast can a utility update feeders uh, to modernize their feeders uh, to meet these customer needs? How fast can that be done? Or is that something that um, it's gonna just have to take time? I can uh, add some perspective as well. I mean, uh, one of the great things, but it's also a little bit of a dangerous thing is to look at a large utility like Encore. Uh, <clears throat> there are equal a number of uh, success stories like that on smaller municipalities who for whatever reason, power marketing uh, have worked on their reliability. And, you know, the deployment it doesn't necessarily need to be system-wide, but they, they, they take on key pockets, industrial uh, sections, and can deploy uh, a lot of these reliability strategies that we've been talking about and Jeremy has been talking about on a regional basis and then systemically kind of uh, expanded from there. Excellent. Um, uh, interesting question, you know, from one of our audience members is how much investment is being made on the distribution system to modernize versus the modernization of the transmission system? Anybody have thoughts on that? I can chime in on, on that with some recent data that I've seen, uh, Spencer. It's, it's interesting because the, the amount on, um, if you go back maybe five, eight years, you'd see numbers that were um, pretty comparable between transmission and distribution systems in the 15 to 20% range. Um, but over time, in at least what planning is, is showing from some EEI numbers, is the distribution is, is overtaking the transmission and it's becoming a larger part of the spend. So people are seeing value in their planning and the in what can be done on distribution systems to improve, uh, improve reliability. Jeremy or Jerry, anything else to add to that? Yeah, I don't have exact numbers, but what I can say is that distributions proportion of spending on feeder modernization is, is increasing. Of course, since 2017 for us, it had a pretty big step change, but in relation to what transmission's doing, I would say we're gaining ground, but um, yeah, I don't have exact numbers from sure. an Encore sure. perspective. Sure. Uh, another great question is how do these modernized feeders react in storms and other major weather events? Well, so, so during storms, um, well, I can take the, the winter storm, for example, uh, that we had here recently. Um, with a rolling blackout, these guys aren't very, very, not a rolling blackout, but manual load shed. Um, they're not very useful <laughs> in that situation. So for talking extreme weather events, we're taking them out of ready, right? So outside of extreme weather events, uh, these guys are really helping a lot on minimizing our permanent outages, you know. For, for us, it's thunderstorms and windstorms and that type of thing. So we got lots of branches. Those trip savers on the line, we have less windshield time, significantly less windshield time because the branches fall out of the um, uh, fall out of the conductors. And so those trip savers are able to clear a lot of our faults as opposed to a slow blow fuse or whatever it may be. Uh, so yeah, they're they're pretty dang helpful. Um, I think this one's uh, good for you, Jerry, is that, you know, if a utility is on its journey, how do they determine kind of where they're at as far as uh, grid mo or feeder modernization? And how do they determine what next steps they should take in updating their feeders? Yeah, I guess uh, to do initial assessment would be the beginning step, you know, where you are on a metrics perspective, where you are in a reliability perspective. Uh, and I, I've also, also seen utilities that have taken the step to see how many of their feeders have the potential of being looped uh, to provide some of these alternate uh, switchback schemes. Um, 
you know, I think the key is to kind of, as, as I think Jeremy is kind of alluding to as well, I mean, this isn't a, it's not a sprint. It's going to be a longer uh, a term process, but the key is to start by taking an initial assessment of where you are in the current condition and, uh, and mapping out a systemic way to improve. Excellent. Another question we just got in, um, and I think anybody, all the panelists or multiple panelists can address this, is that at the very beginning, and I think Jerry, you talked to it, about customer-centric me metrics like SEMI, the question is, do you feel utilities have fully adopted those customer-centric metrics? Yeah, I, I, I'll defer to Jeremy in a second here, but I, I, one thing I probably should have mentioned is, I, I think, uh, at least from what I'm hearing in the utilities that I've come into contact with, you know, certainly the, the quote-unquote, the standard metrics, the SADI, the uh, MAFI, and those type of metrics you know, are, are mainstream and they're used in, in, in a lot of uh, uh, publications, but these customer-centric metrics are really useful in terms of allowing a utility to, to kind of dial in systemic improvements uh, underneath that SADI, SAFI, uh, uh, MAFI umbrella. So it's, it, it, it's, it's like you use the customer-centric metrics to have an overall improvement uh, on the customer experience and still use the, uh, the main uh, reliability metrics that gauge your performance overall. So it's like a two-tiered, one-two punch approach is what I'm seeing. I, I think a lot of utilities use them. How public they are is, is varies all over the map. Jim, yeah. Anything to add? yeah, I'll agree with that. So, so Sadie and Safey are kind of the, and, and Mayfee, they're, they're kind of the big ones. Attack those, get those, uh, you know, quote unquote, under control. And then you can use those finer, you know, the customer Citrix or any of the other manipulations of Sadie, Safey, Mayfee uh, to fine tune your system, to squeeze more out of your reliability that you were going for. So, you know, for example, we're, we've got significant improvements on our Sadie, our Safey, we're starting to see improvements. You know, I don't really want to focus on some more detailed metrics until I have got the big rock out of the way. So we're, we do use those, um, the semi, the Seldi and everything, but yeah, like, like Jerry said, we're not going to make those public because we're still learning where they benefit us and everything as well. So to, to his point, that's kind of the fine tuning knob when Sadie and Safi are your rough course adjustments and you got to get those dialed in first. Absolutely. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I've, I've gotten a lot of questions in this line. So I'm going to try to summarize them all, but essentially I think a lot of our audience is looking at do you think the strategies used at Encore would work at other utilities, both in the U.S. and internationally? So I can, best, yeah. I, I, can, I can give my thoughts. Uh, the, the, my shortcoming is I'm not as familiar with all of the other uh, locations around the world, but I, I, I can say from a broad perspective that yeah, you probably can. The difference will be, okay, what is your, uh, you know, how much overhead versus underground do you have? And, and what, is, what is your ability to have fiber versus radio? You know, uh, radio works for us. Fiber would work better, but it costs so dang much. You know, it's fiber is not an option here for us now. So yeah, I think from a broad perspective, if you're looking at modernizing your feeder, you need to focus on segmenting the feeder and then minimizing those momentaries uh, appropriately. And then the last thing would be, and this was, I believe most of the people said this was their concern with it was the coordination. Uh, if you work out that the, the, the lower energy fault finding, I think will work anywhere. So, so yeah, for the most part from a high level, I do think it will work anywhere, but there's also some specific things that might, might make you pivot on little details of the plan. Jerry, did you have anything else to add to that? I, I would agree. I, I do think uh, just to kind of you know, build on Jeremy, I mean, and he's being humble. I mean, you look at the, the improvement in metrics over time for Encore, that's a great story. That's a double digit percentage improvement in, in reliability metrics. And then you look at the capital expenditure and you know, a lot of those equipment counts that he was showing, uh, you know, that's, it's like the basics he was just mentioning. It's the segmentation, you know, the transient protection, and it's a systemic improvement. I also like the, the point uh, Jeremy made about the deployment of AMI and its usefulness in terms of 
fine tuning or becoming more accurate in your reliability metrics. That's that's kind of also one of the side benefits of an AMI network as well. So it's a lot of the basics that are, are there that, uh, that Jeremy mentioned in his in his portion. Excellent. All right. Well, I do want to be mindful of time, and we're right at time here, so I don't think we can get to the other questions we have. Um, but before we wrap up, as a reminder, uh, we'll be sending a recording of this webinar uh, and a helpful guidebook on modernizing feeders to all those who attended today. In addition, when you leave the webinar, you'll be prompted with a one-question survey on today's uh, content. We would greatly appreciate a few seconds of your time to complete that questionnaire before moving on with the rest of your day. With that, I want to thank Jerry, uh, David, Jeremy for their time today. And for all those who attended today, thank you for spending your valuable time with SNC. Have a great rest of your day and be safe. Thanks all.